Our first speaker this afternoon is Jim Cornell. Uh, many of you may know him from his leadership on several ACI committees, including hot weather and ACI 301 specifications. He uh, spends a lot of time educating people on how to correctly write specifications and has spent uh, 40 years managing and building construction as a contractor, although uh, Jim's background is also has schooling in civil engineering. So he's, he's the mix of the contractor and engineer. And um, recently Jim has struck out on his own for his own uh, consulting firm, Jim Cornell and Associates LLC. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it is a privilege uh, for me today to be to be able to honor Calvin and and recognize the work he's done for for ACI and and also too for our industry. Um, it, it's he's a pretty amazing individual. Today I want to visit a little bit about Calvin, but also too about how ACI spec writing. Um, how we do it, uh, how we've been doing it, and maybe uh, some ideas on, on how we can enhance it to make it more efficient. As we honor Calvin today with our attendance and uh, like to recognize his leadership in ACI, uh, specifically uh, uh, his tenure, He's, he, he was chairman of ACI 301, uh, the specifications for structural concrete during his uh, leadership time. And, and he did serve for two cycles or, or 10 years. Uh, the, the significant event of his second cycle was uh, to develop and, and implement a new way of organizing the committee. Um, and so that we could move forward with that new program. Uh, and at the same time, the rascal went off and, and added to the workload of generating four new sections in ACI 301 to further enhance the document so that we could complement the, the ACI's 318 code. As we want our Calvin, we talk about his other contributions as I've been a consultant, it's rather amazing the amount of research that is published, um, an easy search on Concrete International uh, in our library gives us quite a bit of Calvin's, Calvin's contributions to our industry. And Calvin leads by example. Uh, the fact that he had uh, the second cycle working on the four new sec sections as well as the rewrite um, it, Calvin actually got us started on virtual meetings in, in 2007, 2008. The work were just so large that, that we meet at that time. Also, too, we uh, ended up with Saturday meetings um, in addition to Sunday meetings and Monday meetings. But uh, the unique thing about Saturday meetings is we'd show up uh, – uh, semi-casual in a dress shirt, but Calvin would show up uh, uh, in his uh, golf shirt and his shorts and flip-flops uh, deliberately to to let us know that it was a it was an easy day, but it was still a long working day. But again, I appreciate Calvin's leadership and his contributions to our industry. But but let's let's also recognize that where would Calvin be? Uh, if he didn't, if he didn't have his best friend Barbara, Barbara is Calvin's wife, and and uh, she is very much involved in in his activities, uh, and and very much involved in his life, and uh, it's he's very blessed to have Barbara, so I'd like to honor her as well today with this, just this comment. ACI generates typically reference specifications. And that's a document that um, a specifier in his project documents will refer to an ACI specification so as to include that specification into the project contract documents. As, as he makes that reference specification, a lot of times they'll refer to ACI 301 
the structural structural concrete, the specification for structural concrete. Um, and, and it provides a confidence to the specifier as he looks at that document and has that document into his, in his, um, in a, his quiver that he's got confidence that it's a complete document and a fair document. It provides the detail and depth that on the subject matter that maybe he doesn't have in his specification. And it complements the project documents. What the specifier generally may not know is, is truly what's in the body of the specification, but also too what's that, that the specifier has to respond to the checklist both the, the mandatory checklist, which is requirements that uh, the specifier has to provide in the contract documents, but also to the optional checklist. An example of an optional checklist is, is uh, ACI specifies in 301 um, a maximum hot, fresh, hot, fresh concrete hot temperature of 30, 95 degrees and, and the specifier has the option to adjust that to make sure it matches his, his local, local specification. And that, that way he develops a custom specification. I wanna talk a little bit about the ACI struggle. As we go to write specs, it, it, it is at times a, a frustrating process. Uh, it, it, at times it can be truly a struggle. The, the initial curing specification, the first spec uh, was written in the 90s and, and I was the subcommittee chairman that, that led that group. And here I was leading, but in a lot of times I didn't know where we were going. Um, it, it was a seven year process from from the first commitment in Washington, D.C. to, to publication in, two, in 1998. That, that was a long process. A lot of committee meetings, a time where virtual meetings were not possible. Um, we would book multiple meetings in a convention and, and then we'd end up at Kinko's that evening rewriting a document publishing it on a different colored paper for the next day to then resolve the issues that were clean up the issues and show a more cleaner document to the committee. The other, the other struggle is the technical committee manual, the TCM, and it covers the ground, but, but really there's so much in there and, and it's like, like knowing the code there, it, you've got to really practice it to understand it. And I mentioned, for example, my experience, but the leadership and even the, even the subcommittee that's, that's writing the spec, um, that, that inexperience adds, adds to the struggle and the timeline. Excuse me. What they didn't teach us in college was, was a, the foreign language of mandatory language. Uh, we're, we're all left brain engineers generally. Um, you know, technically, we really know our subject matter. Um, but when it comes to writing and specification language, the mandatory language, we might as well be trying to, to talk to write in Latin or Greek, because um, it's a struggle. ACI also uses trigger language words that, that guide the specifier that leads the specifier to the checklist. And in that, the proper use of that trigger language, we've cleaned it up in the past 10 years, but it's, 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 still, it's still a challenge. And how do we speed up the process? Some of the tools we now have is, is for example, mentoring have an experienced individual that has gone through the process to, to guide and, and uh, train uh, individuals leading the process. Um, 
education of those individuals writing specs, education of the individuals that are leading the spec writing is also important. Uh, a great asset that we have in the, in the past few years is, is E707, the Committee on Specification Education has developed uh, two tutorials that really uh, complement the TCM and how to write a spec. You know, and we really want to praise Amy Pergalski and, and uh, uh, Nick Carino for their work on those two tutorials. Uh, but to quote an individual that watched the tutorials that's been write, writing ACI specs uh, for, for 15 years, he wished he, knew, he had seen those tutorials 15 years ago so he'd know where he was going. So that's a great asset. Another, another thing to speed up the process is, is to get the specification from staff in a two-part format so that it's really two columns, three columns. The far left column is the body of the spec, the actual spec language that's in the contract. The middle column is, is the checklist so that as you're, as you're writing and as you're balloting and as you're resolving ballots, that two-part format allows the committee to easily jump back and forth with their eyes in lieu of jumping up and down the document. Um, it, it really helps us in our virtual meetings to be organized in that manner. The third column on the right is really for notes and for tracking the changes that occurred in the work so that in a couple of years, you don't recycle the second same issue because you might have a tack comment. Some of our strategic reviews can occur during the process. We, we, we do know that we, we're gonna have some re reviews of the document as a whole, but a lot of times if you could get with a mentor or somebody that, that has got plenty of experience on the, on the TCM, they can review your, your spec and make sure you're on the right track. Or do you have it organized properly? Are you following the TCM? The little nuances of, of the editorial issues and how it's organized can be explained and understood. And the other is the mandatory language can be tuned up a little bit during those reviews. And then from that point, take it, take it to a ballot within the committee and, and move down that, that direction. But it's important that everybody that knows what's going to happen, that, that the committee ballots and resolves the ballots, they submit the document for a TAC review. And, and if we've done our job well in mentoring and training, that TAC review is, is really not so much a course correction, but just a review of the document and the content. The second step after the compliance of the TAC review for the committee to understand that there'll be a public review where, where the document, the specification is it published in a format and it's open for everybody and anybody in the industry to comment on the document. And a lot of times those TAC comments and public comments, how meant Mentoring and getting somebody to provide you some advice is really important on how to handle it. For example, in, as we went through the public review on the hot weather spec in the, in the mid 80s, we had 256 items that, that took us about two years to address and, and get behind us. And yet we can take a 301 document that goes for a public review and handle more comments than that in a shorter time period because, because as Dan Falconer advised us, you're really looking not so much for the new business, but for that big glaring thing that needs to be corrected and, and to then put things into new business for the next cycle. 
So some of that advice is really important and can, can save the committee quite a bit of time. And so from that, I head to one of my favorite pictures of some form work from over 100 years ago in uh, San Francisco. And I'd like to uh, move forward as, as we honor Calvin. Um, I want to thank you, Calvin, for, for all you've done for the, for the industry, for ACI, and, and for me personally. I appreciate your mentoring me as, as I've been in ACI 301 and, and mentoring me as I've struck out as a consultant. And I really appreciate you, and I want to thank you. It's been my privilege to work with you and, uh, and to know you and, and Barbara as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't tell the story about Barbara's hub and I'll, I'll close with that. Uh, Calvin and I were having a discussion in 2009 in California and Barbara was standing there with us and Calvin turned to Barbara and he said that Jim is accepted to be chairman of the next cycle. And I got the biggest bear hug in the world from Barbara to communicate to me that there was a way for Calvin to, to cycle off as, as his leadership role. But the reality is he continued as, as a mentor uh, to myself and others, and we really appreciate it. Again, Barbara, I always value your hug. And with that, I'll close and I'm, I'm open uh, for any, any questions that might come up. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jim, very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, we do have one question in the Q&A box. If you have more, um, please fill in your questions into the Q&A box. Um, there is a question asking for examples of trigger language. Um, Dave, to answer that, there's essentially two types of, of trigger language that we use uh, in the TCM and in our specifications. Um, and I'm, I want to make sure I quote it properly, but if we're going to have a mandatory language uh, referral in our specification, we use the phrase as indicated in the contract documents. So so that as a design professional is, is reading through, say, say drilled peers, he will see that, that he's got to provide in that specification uh, whether or not, uh, what, what is the strength of the concrete? What is the reinforcing steel that will be in that drilled pier? Um, there are some things that he, um, has to provide as as the, the design professional. Now on the optional checklist, we've actually got a couple couple phrases. Um, uh, the one referral phrase is unless otherwise specified. Um, in that case, uh, uh, to use uh, my my uh, hot weather. Uh, fresh concrete temperature in the 301 spec, uh, we specify, we state, unless otherwise specified, provide a, a hot weather temperature of 95 degrees. The words unless other, otherwise specify flag to the, des, to the design professional and also to the contractor that they could go read um, the comments in the in the optional checklist, and and it's not an opportunity for the for ACI to add commentary in a checklist, but instead we might refer in this case to ACI uh, uh, 305 to the hot weather committee for more for more information on on what what other values for hot weather concrete you could have. Another referral phrase we use is if specified. Um, if it, it's kind of a uh, additional requirements that that a, that a specifier could have in his in his document, um, and I don't have a real quick off the top of my head example of that one, David. I I apologize. 
there is another question I'm going to ask keep you on the line, Jim. If an ACI committee writes construction specs, can they reference 301 for concrete materials or should they write a freestanding document? Uh, Jim, you, you want to take that? Because I, I tempted I, myself. Go ahead. I think I can. The, when, when a specifier refers to an ACI document, um, whether it be 301 or 117 on tolerances, or 336 on drilled piers, he, he has to take the whole document and not a portion of the document. Uh, in 301, it's got multiple uh, subjects in the different sections, and, and it's up to the specifier, for example, to, in the contract drawings, define what members of the structure are to be included as mass concrete to define what's architectural, but the real, he has to take the whole document and only by application take in sections six through 14, uh, but, but he can't just grab section four, uh, which is concrete material. He's, he's gotta take the whole document. Excellent answer, Jim. So there is a way, uh, to, but you'd have to take the exact sentence out and write it into your document in mandatory language. So it's a dangerous uh, way to live, but um, yeah, exactly right, Jim. The whole document, not parts. 